All right. Good evening, everybody. If you have your Bibles, turn to Jonah. Turn to the book of Jonah. I, um, I use my hands a lot when I'm preaching and teaching, and I feel like I'm going to knock this over, and the iPad's going to fall. It's going to go everywhere. So I'm just like... I watched the, the video of me, I guess the last time I did this, and I'm like stiff as a board, and Timmy's like, you've got to do something with your hands. So I'm still figuring that out. Book of Jonah. Let me pray, and then we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for your word. We, we thank you that you've given us a record of how you've worked in the world and what you're doing and how we can play a part of that. We pray that you bless our study right now in Jesus' name. Amen. What is your, what's your favorite apocalyptic story? Like an end time, big, world's going to end story. Do y'all have a favorite one? Revelation. Revelation. You are such a Christian. <laughs> the Walking Dead. No. The Walking Dead. That's that's what I thought of. What else? Well, first of all, why do you like The Walking Dead? Uh, just moving targets. <laughs> you just want to shoot some zombies. Joe just wants to shoot some zombies. Uh, what else? What's another story? That's a favorite. What? Have y'all seen, like, I Am Legend? Yes. Would that be? Like, that's a good one. I like that one. I, if I watch these top stories, I have to, it's got to be by myself. Tiffany does not like seeing any kind of big, nasty zombies or anything. Uh, Book of Eli, wouldn't that be an apocalyptic story? Why do you think we like these stories? Adding, t- Joe gave us his answer. Why, why are we interested in these apocalyptic end time stories? Because like what if situations. Like a what if. That's a great answer. Good job, I think. You something to think about? Something to think about, yeah. Like if you're faced with that, what would you do? Like I need to get a generator. <laughs> I mean, I need to learn to live off the <laughs> land if the, the, somebody blows up the Dollar General. You know, what am I going to do? So it's, it's kind of like a, um, you get a, an idea of what you would need to do to survive in this big Judgment Day-like scenario that will affect millions of people. So as you know, God is holy. He doesn't overlook sins. He doesn't ignore your sins. And He cannot because He is perfectly holy. Therefore, He will deal with our sins and He will take everything into account and He will render a verdict and a judgment. And you will either face that punishment, that Judgment Day, or Jesus will face it for you. God is patient. Uh, first of all, there is God deals with us on a personal level, but there are times when He deals with people in a national level, a big collective level, uh, because we are all image bearers in His in His image. God is patient, but there are times when nations get so wicked. God will bring about a pre-apocalyptic judgment on them. He's given us a foretaste of divine judgment by scattering and destroying nations in their sinful works. Theologians call this the intrusion of the kingdom. It's like a, a taste of judgment day before Jesus returns. And we've seen this all throughout history. Some love in some portions. The... Um, miss my place here. Yeah. God has given us a foretaste of divine judgment. We, we've seen that. We see this all throughout history of people becoming so wicked, they push the boundaries of God's common grace, order of justice and common equity. God gives all men some level in some portion the ability to function as his image bearers, even if they don't know him. Like there's, we're still going to function in, in society. This is so um, culture can happen, society can function, so people can multiply and flourish even if they're not saved. This is called common grace. It doesn't mean the same thing as saving grace. Okay, Common grace is given so that there's not complete anarchy in the world. 
God holds us back from becoming more wicked than we should be. But if we ignore the moral law of God seen in creation and suppress the truth and unrighteousness where wickedness is so prevalent, God will intervene and destroy, destroy us. And we've seen this countless of times. We see this all throughout Scripture. We see it in the flood, Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, and we'll see later in, in, in Jonah. We see this in Israel and Judah when they face uh, exile. We see this with the Assyrians. The Assyrians are judged by the Babylonians. The Babylonians are judged by the Persians. The Persians are judged by the Greeks. The Greeks are judged by the Romans. If the nation is wicked, they will be judged. God is not going to let wickedness spread so far and out of control. He will rein things back in if people ignore the light of nature, the light, his, his moral law. So before all this, because of this, I should say, God has a plan of salvation. And this, the spearhead, the thing that gets the ball rolling is God's promise to Abraham. And what does God promise Abraham? A son, a nation, and the nations from you, you'll bless the nations. You'll be a blessing. Your people will bless the nations. And this promise of blessing is picked up again and shown to be fulfilled in John 3.16. God so loved the world, the, the people that God will save, that He gave His only Son that whoever trusts in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. God gave the ultimate Isaac to bless the world. Jesus is how Abraham will be used to bless the world. Jesus, the descendant of Abraham, he comes as the means of practical connection point shows God's love to bless the nations and providing a way for them to be saved. So that, so that's the big idea behind the existence of Israel, to bring about a savior from their midst, from this people group. Big plan of salvation. So here's Jonah. What we're going to see is Jonah on board with the big plan, this descendant of Abraham. And, uh, is, is he on board with blessing the nations? And we're going to see, we're going to see that Jonah idolizes his nation. He would rather seek the interest of, well, he's in the northern kingdom because the, at this point the kingdom is divided between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But he would rather be about his people, their good, and not anybody else, especially not the Assyrians. He goes so far as to talk back to God. It's crazy. And he would rather die than help those outside of his borders. And I've always been, like, curious about his motivation. Like, what's your deal, Jonah? What, why are you, like, so mm, not willing to do anything? You're talking back to God. Isn't that crazy? And that's it's insane. So we have the book of Jonah. Do we see what he's about? Jesus mentions Jonah, and we have a, a place in 2 Kings that mentions Jonah. Turn to 2 Kings real quick. 2 Kings chapter 14, and also turn to Amos chapter 7. There's some really interesting um, places in Scripture that could shed light on motivation for why Jonah is a jerk like he is. 2 Kings 14. We're going to get into the book of Jonah here in a second. All right, this is 2 Kings and then Amos chapter 7. All right, this is 2 Kings. Uh, does somebody want to read that? Because I love hearing y'all butcher these names like I do. Either I butcher them or y'all can. Oh, sorry. For the sake of time, let me just, let me just, let me just read this real quick. This is uh, 2 Kings 14. This is at verse 23 through 27. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king of Samaria. This is all about the northern kingdom, okay? Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Please stay with me. I think this is going to pay off, okay? He, he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He, 
He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel. Okay, so this is Jeremiah, this is Jeroboam 2. He's named after the wicked king, and he is a wicked king himself. He's named after the first king of the northern tribe when they, when they split. He was the one who, who restored, this is, the, this is the takeaway right here, he was the one that restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through the servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath, Keeper. So Jonah helps, he's with this Jeroboam II. God um, uses Jonah, and they retake this land. It's just a big land restored, and a lot of good um, for them happened. And this could help us understand Jonah's motivation. Jonah prophesied during the peaceful, prosperous time of Jeroboam II, who was just an evil king. Jonah's known for helping the northern kingdom help recover and expand the borders of the northern kingdom, which is Israel. The increase of its territory will result in producing an unhealthy Pride and patriotism in the heart of Jonah. Okay, this, this could have been what happened. Jonah was part of a brief, successful campaign to get a huge portion of land back from Assyria. Okay, now this is where it gets really mysterious. Okay, and I'm just, I, I, this is just awesome. Okay, this blessing from the Lord of retaking the land in the northern kingdom. Again, you have the northern kingdom, which is Israel. You have the southern kingdom, which is Judah. This is after David, after Solomon. Big split, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Israel's, I'm sorry, Jonah is where? Where is he? North or south? He's in the north, northern kingdom. Okay? And then you got Amos. Amos is in the southern kingdom. Amos comes up from Judah to the northern tribes and prophesies against them, calling Jonah's ministry into question. Amos says they need to repent or they themselves will be led off into exile. Amos, we're going to see in a second, in Amos 7, Amos is like a Jonah to Jonah's homeland. God sends Amos to Judah, to the northern tribes, tells him to repent. So let's look at Amos 7, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Quote, Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all of his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Quote, Jeroboam, this is Jeroboam 2, will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, talking to Amos, he said, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Go back south, where you came from. And this, this is weird because this is Jonah's turf. This is his homeland. And we just saw Jonah helping Amaziah Jeroboam the second. So what's going on here? It's like, Jonah, can you believe this guy? Can you believe this Amos? He comes from the south, Judah. They think they're better than us. And he says that we're going to lose the land that we just took from the Assyrians. Who does he think he is? So the question is, why did Amos have to come up to Judah if Jonah was the prophet in the land? And of course, we see in 722, Amos' words come true. The northern kingdom is destroyed by the Assyrians. Why do you think Amos, why do you need Amos to come to Judah if you have Jonah in town? Whatever the case, something other than God was on Jonah's heart. Something was off with Jonah. So this background information in these two passages could shed light on Jonah's motivation for his strange behavior through the book of Jonah. His callous, his heartless attitude toward pagans, God has called him to. He's called to 
save and help people he knows, Jonah, that could later skin his people alive, his family. So if you think about this, it's kind of like, um, it's pretty violent. Um, like Saving Private Ryan, what did they do with that German soldier? They let him go. Only, to, only for that German soldier to reappear and kill his friends. So this is the last thing Jonah would want to do. And so God says, I've got a mission for you. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to take this message to the Assyrians. And he's called not just to go to Assyria in general, but go to the heart of the beast, Nineveh itself, which is the capital of Assyria. It, Assyria was the most brutal, oppressive, violent nation. This is from a commentary. It, Assyria was the most brutal, violent, oppressive, and violent nation in all the ancient empires. Assyrians, when they would come in, they would skin you alive. They would, um, they would plunder, rape, and take you back to Assyria as slaves. Not only are they wicked people, Jonah is, he's centered on his people. He idolizes his culture. And you will we'll see he's apathetic to the spiritual needs of the pagans around him. As far as the nations, uh, as far as other nations outside of Israel, they can go to hell. And he wants God to send them there. This is Jonah. This is what he wants. But God is calling Jonah on a mission to warn men of coming judgment. Again, their wickedness is broke out. And God is about to destroy the Assyrians in Nineveh. And so, think about us trying to pull this into application for us. Think about, is there a difficult person in your life that you don't want to talk to, that you don't want to love, but you know God is calling you to love? And it's like pulling your teeth to do that. So, let's, um, let's look at the book of Jonah. Who wants to, um, does somebody want to read... Chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 1 through 6. So when do we get that? It's only like two pages in my Bible, so I think we can get through it. Who wants to get that? I'll get that first. Go ahead. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son, the son <clears throat> of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Okay, pause. So this is what I do in Sunday school. Johnny <laughs> knows this. Y'all reading, and I say, stop! Because I gotta interject. So, uh, Tarshish is like on the edge of the known world. It is so far away from this area. It's like, uh, it's just south of Spain in the Strait of Gibraltar. Like, you go to Tarshish, you're literally going to the edge of the known world. As far as you can go, you go past Tarshish, you're entering the abyss of the Atlantic Ocean. That's where Jonah wants to go. That's how strongly he does not want to help the Assyrians. Go ahead, play. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord, Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had laid down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give you a thought, a thought to us that we may not perish. Okay, thanks. All right, Joe, go ahead and read the, to the end of chapter, I mean, to, to chapter 2. Read the rest of it. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. 
Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quieten down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will be quiet down, will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done it as please you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay. Thank you, Joe. There's, this is structured in a way where you see the irony. Okay. Um, we have Jonah telling these, um, that these pagan sailors are like, who are you? Where do you come from? And he's like, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. <laughs> you're supposed to read that and laugh because he doesn't fear the Lord. He's running from God. He's not obedient. He's not being faithful. Another thing to bring out, and we'll get to this later, is Jonah says, I did this. It's me. I'm the problem. It's me. I'm glad y'all not laughing. Some of y'all laughed. Some of y'all not caught, caught that reference. It's only because Tiffany. Um, he's the problem, and he knows it. And he says, cast me overboard, and this wrath sea will stop. What, do you, what could have Jonah just have done? What could he have just done? Jumped in the sea. Just jumped out. Just stepped out himself. No, but he, is, he needs to be cast out by people, almost like a sacrifice to assuage a wrath. And we'll get more into that later. So now he is, he's swallowed up by a great fish, and we're going to hear Jonah's prayer. And um, we're going to see the heart of somebody who is in a, who's in a very difficult situation. And so the question is, is this going to change Jonah's heart? Is being in a fish, and I've never been in a fish, um, but one time I was camping with some friends. Uh, it, we were in a small tent, and it was cold, and I was sleeping next to this, my big, huge friend who's kind of who's, who's husky, all right? And uh, Tiffany's ex boyfriend. So it was very difficult. It was a very <laughs> difficult to sleep, all right? But my bigger friend, would roll over, he snored, so I couldn't go to sleep because of the sound. But he was like pushing me against the, the side of the tent. So I was like smothered. I was like, this has got to be what Jonah experienced. Like, this is so uncomfortable. He was so miserable. Anyway, that must have been what it was like um, for Jonah. Minus the ex <laughs> <laughs> All right, who wants to get... Uh, chapter 2. So we're going to see, does this predicament change Jonah's heart? He wants to read chapter 2. John, I'll take it. I gave you the look, didn't I? You did. John. I knew you wanted me to. Yeah, I knew you wanted to. Well, Journaling Johnny knows <laughs> he can do it. <laughs> All right, here we go. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look, again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up. You brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Okay. <coughs> Sounds very poetic. 
Like this is a this is a beautiful prayer. It flows really nice. There's true theology in it. There's an interesting observation in this prayer, though, and this is from the ESV Study Bible. Jonah prays, but he did not pray for God to save the pagan sailors, but only thank God for saving him. Jonah's prayer is not a request to be saved from the fish, but is is thanksgiving for being saved by the fish. This is still a Jonah-centered prayer. Again, God is calling the people of Israel, Abraham's descendants, to be part of blessing the world. I know it's like a cliche, but you're blessed to be a blessing, okay? Blessed to be a blessing. Y'all haven't seen that on bumper stickers? All right. Um, Jonah's called to do that. And he's still not <coughs> outward focused, thinking about the people that you caused this, Jonah. You caused this sea. You're the problem here. And you had to be thrown out. And he's still just about himself. Jonah is thankful for God showing him mercy, but he still hates the idea of showing mercy toward the Ninevites. So, application for us, we can say a lot of good words, good theology, but words mean nothing. It's the actions that matter. And I've been learning that so much lately. Sometimes people say super spiritual language to mask their disobedience. I think Jonah, I think he means what he says to the Lord in the belly of this fish, but his heart is not fully repentant. This is like a half-hearted prayer at the most. 1 John 4, 4.20 says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He's a liar. It's strong language. And does Jonah love the other outside person? He doesn't. God brings in difficult people to test our hearts. The pagan sailors show up in his prayer. You can see this at the end. He says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake the hope of steadfast love. That just, that's beautiful, but come on, Jonah. Turn, you know, look at, you know, look what you're doing. But I, with the voice of, th- voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you uh, that, I have, that I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It's, again, it's that same idea of like, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. <laughs> you don't. Good theology does not mean someone is obedient to the Lord. John has good theology. Salvation is of the Lord. These pagans are in vain. Um, those who pay regard to idol, uh, idols forsake their hope of steadfast love that is so true. But come on, you're, you're cloaking, you're masking your disobedience. So let's, let's look at chapter 3. And you, you get this, the Bible uses the word vomit. And, and some commentators think that that's what God thinks about Jonah right now. It's just like, bleh. he could have just showed up, released him. I don't know, I don't know if there's another word for vomit that's less, like, disgusting. But he shows up, and he has new life. And let's see what he does. What's he going to do? Somebody read uh, chapter 3. Who wants to get that? Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against him the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. 
Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from His fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that He had said He would do to them, and He did not do it. Okay. That's bad. All right. So he's commissioned, John is commissioned again to reach Nineveh. He goes reluctantly. Y'all notice anything strange about this, this message? Jonah's message is, hey, 40 days, this place is going to burn. <laughs> it's very truncated. He doesn't explain who this is from or anything else, but God blesses it. God uses it to turn the hearts of the people of, of Nineveh. But you get this feeling like, I'm here, but I don't want to do this. And we're going to see later, we're going to see Jonah kind of watch and see, you know, if they're going to be obedient or not. I think he's waiting for like a firework show. Okay, let's look at, um, let's look at, who wants to get the last chapter, chapter four? Who wants to get that? I'll read it. Go ahead. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is, is it not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it, would, that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Okay, thank you. The apocalypse was averted. They listened to Jonah's message, and they, they lived to... <laughs> For a brief time after that, uh, they, they survived the being retold um, through Hollywood of fire from heaven. Here's what's so amazing about this. We see that Jonah, there's something about God, there's something about God that Jonah does not like. Um, well, let me, let me ask this. What, did, what do you think is the root? Jonah's angry, and he says, I'm angry enough to die. And we see this all throughout this book. He's like, I'd rather go to Tarshish, throw me overboard. Um, I'm angry enough to die. I mean, he's like, he's just ready to just, he, he would rather die than see the Assyrians flourish, apparently. And so this great, this change of heart in this people happens, and he is the vehicle of it. And instead of rejoicing, He's frustrated, so he's, he's, even, he's angry, angry enough to die is what it says. So what is the root of God, sorry, what is the root of Jonah's anger? What is the root of Jonah's anger? Pride. Anybody? What's the root of Jonah's anger? I'm looking at you, verse 2. Look at verse 2. He says, I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Isn't this crazy? Like, I knew you were going to do this. I knew you are the kind of God. 
And it, he's, he's quoting basically e- Exodus 34, verse 6, which says, The Lord, the Lord, a, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Jonah, you know theology. You, you are a descendant of Abraham. You should be on the mission. And here you are, like talking back to God, hating and that basically an attribute of God so much that you want to die rather than see that attribute go forth in saving people. Isn't that nuts? That just, it's, it's, it's still... That's the root of Jonah's anger. So it's, it's like this. If we could sum up what I'm trying to say... Jonah was like, it's grace to me and, and not to thee, you know? It's like, the, it's like that church lady type thing. It's like, you show me all the grace, but mm, I, I don't know about you. You're not, worthy of, you're not worthy of it, you dirty, rotten pagan. He has his grace for me and not to thee attitude. The irony is Jonah and his people, his nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, again, the northern kingdom, are just end up being just as wicked and God later used the Assyrians to wipe out the northern tribes completely, like gone. Nineveh actually lasts longer than the northern kingdom does. The book ends with a question. And I think this is designed to challenge the reader. Are you going to be about the mission to bless the world with the message of salvation or are you going to spend your life avoiding the calling of the calling that God has on all of us to play our part in reaching our family, our friends, and co-workers. And so what happens to Jonah? So what happens after this book? Um, the, the book ends in kind of an open-ended way. I think the existence of this book proves that Jonah finally understood the message and conformed to the heart of God and his plan for the nation. Because it's kind of like so I feel like we have this book because Jonah got it. Kind of like, um, kind of like Peter is the main source of the Gospel of Mark. Mark has full of embarrassing Peter stories only, that only Peter would know. Or, yeah, that only Peter could, could share and relay that to Mark. In the same way, Jonah, the book of Jonah is like this. And so what happened to Nineveh? Did the revival last in Nineveh? Do y'all, I kind of hinted at that earlier. Did the revival last? No, it did not. Not long after this, the wicked city comes and destroys the northern kingdom. And they go back to their pagan ways. And there's a clue, there's a clue in the scriptures right here about why the repentance didn't last. And I think this is another interesting point that you, you slow down and just kind of look at the words. It kind of... It shows itself. Notice that the people in Nineveh did not call God by his covenantal name, but by a general name of Elohim. You see that in, it just says God. That's Elohim. Their repentance was based on fear, and it didn't lead them to seek and know the God in a loving way. They didn't seek to know God as he is defined in Scripture. The Ninevites did not move from a general understanding of God to a saving covenantal understanding of Him as Yahweh, the Lord. When you see the Lord, it's, it means Yahweh, His covenantal name, His saving name. Why do we know for sure, um, who do we know for sure came to know the Lord in all of this? Who do we know for sure, definitely, I mean, we kind of still don't know about Jonah, we know that Syrians end up, maybe, I'm sure some of them became true followers of, of the Lord. But who do we know for certain? Who do y'all think? Who, who, who do we know comes to know the Lord in this? For sure. You want to guess? Some educated guess? Men on the boat. The men on the boat. Johnny. Point got to Johnny. Yes. Look at Jonah 1.16. What are the, these pagan sailors, what do they do? 
It says, Jonah 1.16 says, Then the, the men feared, what does it say? Does it say God? It says the Lord. The men feared the Lord, Yahweh, not Elohim, exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The sailors learned what God required of them and how they should worship Him. So they get done with this ordeal, and they're like, the God of Israel saved our life. A man was cast out so that we can be saved. And they go, and after when they get to land, they make sacrifices. And they're calling Him Yahweh, the Lord. The sailors were truly saved. They sought to know the Lord as He's defined Himself in Scripture. They made sacrifices when they got back to land. So what do you think God was teaching Jonah? What do you think God is teaching Jonah and us? What are some things? You can't hide. Can't hide? That's good. Yep. Even if you go to the edge of the known world, God will... If He wants to use you, He will use you. It's true. What else? It's a measurable grace. Yes, right. Yep. His attitude, Jonah's attitude is inconsistent with the foundation of why he and his people exist. God told Abraham that the nation will be blessed through him. Israel is a holy space in the world and a light to the nations. You have this come and see element, but also with Jonah and other prophets, there's a go and tell to other nations to repent and look to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jonah points to us to Christ in parallel and in contrast. Jesus says that Jonah points to what his death will look like. Jonah was swallowed in a fish as a means to bring a message of death to Nineveh. Jesus was swallowed in death to bring a message of life to the world. Jonah was cast out into the sea to save sailors. Jesus was cast out into the darkness to save us. The wrath of the sea was taken away by one man being cast out for the many. Jonah was disobedient to the point of death. Remember him saying, I'm so angry I could die. But Jesus was obedient to the point of death. Philippians 2 says he was humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death and death on the cross. After receiving a call of God to Nineveh, Jonah gets in a boat and sails to the edge of the known world. Jesus, after receiving the call before the foundation of the earth, he enters our dark, sinful world to save us. Jonah arrives to Nineveh. He gives this half-hearted, lame message. Yet 40 days and 40, uh, uh, 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. He doesn't even explain who he represents. Jesus shows up to earth, expresses the fullness of God in human form. Jesus doesn't just deliver an exhaustive message from God. He is the message and the messenger. Jonah wanted judgment to be the final word of Nineveh, on Nineveh. Jesus took our judgment so that we could receive the final word of grace and peace. We need a Jonah to come into our world and save us. And Jesus joyfully came to us. So a few little application points, and then we're done. Application, point number one, the sailors, one, one of three, so you know. Uh, my son, Caden, he's always like, how long is this going to take, Dad? How many points you got, you know? Because he wants to know about time. Three points, application. The sailors who, who God saved made vows and promises to the Lord to follow him. Look at yourself. Are you following the Lord or are you like Jonah using theology and God taught to mask your disobedience? Now, I'm, I'm asking myself that. I mean, that's an honest question to myself. I, look and I need to not just be, do a Jonah to y'all and look at me, y'all the problem. Look at myself in the mirror. Just because you know a lot of truth does not mean you're obedient with the truth that you know. Point number two, we ourselves are living sacrifices. Are you living for Him? Or are you like Jonah, stuck up, you can't see past your own needs, and you act like everybody else is a problem, everybody else is an idiot? 
Is your, are you apathetic toward those around you? You could care less about anybody other than yourself, much less your enemy. Forget the Ninevites, you don't even love your family. Some of y'all disrespect your parents, guardians, people in your life that God has given you to love. And what do you want to do? You want to go to Tarsus. You want to get out of the house. You don't want to listen. See this as an opportunity to say, Lord, help me to love these people. Let me push through my, my hang-ups and repent of my sin and see this as an opportunity to show my love for you through loving them. Last point. This book is a challenge for us to find our nearest neighbor, push through our emotions, get over ourselves, and love that difficult person. Life is too short not to keep good connections with people and seek to love them and bless them. You never know when their time, when your time is up or their time is up, and you'll never see them again unless they know Jesus. So make the most of every opportunity that God has given us. See difficult people as God giving you an opportunity to image forth His nature in being, quote, gracious and merciful. I knew you were gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Make the most of every opportunity to, to do this. And I know that's easier said than done, but we are a community that is, we are formed around the cross. That's our centerpiece of why we exist. We don't exist just because we like each other, we get along, or we, we have, play games or whatever. What draws us together is the cross. That's the centerpiece. And we're called to live differently. Not because we're better, but because we have been shown God's grace. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word. Lord, we thank you for this challenge um, to not just be uh, self-centered, not to be self-centered, but to love our neighbor, to be a part of what you're doing in the world, to not just go about our lives, but see, see others as an opportunity to, to love on, to share the good news. The, the greatest expression of love to them is to point them to you. Help us to represent you well. Help us to be consistent with what you, with what you have told us about how believers in you should live. If we don't love our neighbor, we are a liar, and the truth of God is not in us. Help us not to spout a bunch of theology if we are not walking in consistent with that truth that we claim to know. Give us a heart that love you, and uh, we pray that you bless our effort to make the most of our opportunity to tell people that there's a great judgment to come, but there's a, a way for them to be saved through Jesus. We pray that you bless these, uh, these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.